St. Teresa of Avila, when she was composing a prayer and a letter to her sisters, was talking about the Eucharist and the Blessed Sacrament. And she commented on how there's a lot of people who say that it would be amazing to live and walk during the time of Christ and to see him and to walk with him and to hear him speak. But she answers that, she says, my Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, I know him and I know that his presence before me is just as real, just as powerful, just as instructive as if I was there with him when he walked the earth. Such that she follows up that statement with a, a rather stark statement. She says, people who seek this and then go to Mass, I ask them, what more could you possibly want? What more could you possibly want than Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament? I think that's an excellent question. What more could we want in the Blessed Sacrament? Father John Harden said that it's ignorance of the Blessed Sacrament, ignorance of the faith, that is extremely spiritually dangerous, he used to say. He used to quote the parable of uh, the scattering of the seed, right? Whenever the, the sower would come and he'd scatter the seed on, on, to gr on the ground. And this, one of the grounds was very rocky, and so the uh, seed couldn't take. Another was the, uh, the, the ground filled with thorns, and the thorn choked the seed, right? And then, and then there was the one seed that fell on, on good ground. But Father Hardin focuses in on specifically the seed that falls on the path. The seed that falls on the path. Because the path, it doesn't really have enough to take root, and the birds come and they pick it up, right? And what his point there is, he's, he's saying that those whose faith is weak, they might hear the word, they might even say they believe the word and accept it, but because of their, the weakness of their faith, the ignorance of their faith, the demons come in, they grab that faith and they take it away. And now we no longer have it, right? Ignorance of the faith is extremely spiritually dangerous. That's why uh, the Lord is constantly trying to raise up his disciples' understanding of the law of God, right? This problem of ignorance of the faith is ne nothing new. And as a matter of fact, the Lord's instruction, you can see, he emphasized mostly when he was talking about the Eucharist. There are not a lot of teachings that our Lord gave where he taught it to both the Jews and the Gentiles, but he did with the Eucharist. Now, he was much more explicit with the Jews, but he still gave the same theological meaning behind it. Because we have the John chapter 6, which is the gospel we, we, we read today, right? Where our Lord goes to uh, his uh, Jewish disciples, and he feeds the 5,000. He multiplies the loaves and the fishes, right? He, he, he provides for them physical food, physical bread. And he's using this physical bread, this miracle of the multiplication, to raise up their minds, to give them something more, to show them that there's something more than physical bread, that there is a more important bread, which is spiritual nourishment, and that's what he's leading them to, right? But they don't get it. They can't understand it. So he begins his discourse, his what we call the bread of life discourse in John chapter 6, and he tells them, that his flesh is the life of the world. His flesh is the life of the world. And they're like, what is he talking about? This is, this is crazy. Who, who would say this? They, they were very much scandalized by the saying because there are many instances in the old law that says you're not even allowed to eat the blood of an animal or the, the flesh of an animal that still has his blood in it, right? So if the idea of eating another person, a human's flesh with its blood in it, is unthinkable. Now, does the Lord say, well, 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 you, you're misunderstanding what I'm saying. I'm only talking symbolically or I'm only talking metaphorically or anything. No, he doesn't do that at all. As a matter of fact, he turns it up. He makes it worse. He says, I tell you that unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood 
of the Son of Man, you do not have life within you. If you look at the Greek translation of that word, uh, when, the, when he says, unless you eat my flesh, it actually, the Greek word that John uses in his gospel ha- can be translated, has the connotation of gnawing, like, like you're eating animal flesh, like gnawing on it. In other words, the Lord was very graphic. He was very explicit. He left no broom for interpretation. He said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you will not have life within you. Many could not accept that. And many of them left. I love that a scene that happens immediately after that where the Lord turns to his disciples and he says to them, particularly the 12 apostles, right? He turns to the 12 apostles and he says, are you going to leave too? Are you going to abandon me because this saying is hard? And Peter steps up and speaks for the rest of the disciples. And as Fulton Sheen points out, without their permission, which is very important because he speaks from the Spirit, he speaks from the authority of God, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. The implications of that statement are extremely important for our Catholic faith. Why? Because there are often times where our faith is hard to understand is hard to accept. But the trust that we put in God gives us the ability to say, Lord, to whom else shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. I may not understand this. I may not completely get it. But I know that it must be true if you and your church proclaim it. You know, Walker Percy was once asked, he, they asked him, why are you a Catholic? Or particularly, why did you become Catholic? And he looked at them and quite simply said, what else is there? What else is there? I think that's a very brilliant answer. Now the Lord, he continues this explanation, that he continues this image when he goes to the Decapolis, when he, when he, tra- he travels over to the ten cities, right, into Gentile territory. Now this is no longer Jewish territory, right? And he, the, the crowd of 4,000 men gather around him, and he says he's moved with pity for them, and he multiplies the loaves and the fishes again for them, again calling to mind that imagery of the Eucharist, that our Lord is trying to raise up their minds to show them there's something more than physical food here. There's a spiritual food that he's going to provide for you. In other words, I am the one who's going to provide for you, right? And then I love that scene afterwards. uh, He goes and he gets in the boat with the disciples. And up to this point, the disciples haven't gotten any of it either. And they forget to bring bread. You know, this is all in the Gospel of Mark. They They forgot to bring bread with them. And so they're all worried. They got this journey to travel, right? And they don't have any food for the Lord. And so uh, they're afraid to tell him because they're embarrassed. And uh, so, uh, the, you know, finally, once the Lord gets in the boat, they say, you know, Lord, we, we kind of forgot to bring bread. And uh, the, the Lord says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the hypocrisy. Why is he bringing that up? Why is he bringing up the, the hypocrisy and the leaven of the Pharisees? Because the Pharisees lived the exact life of, of non-faith that he was trying to bring them out of that they, they lived all these hundreds of prescriptions, all of these, these so-called commandments for themselves and not for God. And he's saying, the whole, this whole time I've been multiplying the loaves and the fishes for the Jews, I've been multiplying the loaves and the fishes for the Gentiles, I'm trying to show you that you never find fulfillment, you never find nourishment here, you never even find nourishment in the fulfillment of prescriptions you only find that nourishment in me. And I love Mark, he says, there was only one loaf in the boat. There was only one loaf in the boat. He actually uses that word, loaf. He's, of course, referring to the Lord. And then the disciples, still not getting it, say, is he saying this because we forgot to bring bread? And now the Lord gets irritated with them. He says, do you still not understand? When I multiplied the loaves and the fishes, 
How many baskets were left over for the Jews? They said five, they said 12. How many were left over for the Gentiles? They said seven. I can make bread for you. That's not the issue. Do you still not understand? And so today, our Lord is asking us, and I think especially in this feast of Corpus Christi, this feast of the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, He wants us to allow him to increase our faith, to help us to grow, especially with those teachings that are difficult to understand. The Eucharist is hard to understand. It's hard to necessarily always keep that solid faith in Jesus present in the Eucharist. But with the help of God and the trust of Peter, To say, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of everlasting life. We can have an experience of Mass that is life-changing. I oftentimes say that every Mass that we attend should be a life-changing experience. Why? Because God is there. Every Mass we attend should be a life-changing experience. Oftentimes you hear it said, I don't like going to Mass because I don't get anything out of it. Well, I ask the same question, St. Teresa of Avila. What more do you want? Right? I don't get anything out of it, but it's God. It's God standing before me. You don't get much better than that. So today I'd like to close with the prayer, with the excerpt from Teresa of Avila. This prayer that she wrote to her sisters, calling them to understand, to appreciate more deeply what they were experiencing. I invite you to listen to her words. Also, listen to her humility. Listen to how she approaches the Blessed Sacrament. She says, How would I, a poor sinner, who have so often offended you, Dare to approach you, O Lord. If I beheld you in all your majesty, under the appearances of bread, however, it is easy to approach you. For if a king disguises himself, it seems as if we do not have to talk to him with so much circumspection and ceremony. If you were not hidden, O Lord, who would dare to approach you with such coldness, so unworthily and with so many imperfections? Besides, I cannot doubt at all about your real presence in the Eucharist. You have given me such a lively faith that when I hear others say they wish they had been living when you were on earth, I laugh to myself, for I know that I possess you as truly in the Blessed Sacrament as people did then. And I wonder what more anyone could possibly want.